Are you listening? Welcome to the Nerf Report. My name is Brian. Thank you so much for joining us this week. A lot has happened since we've last talked. Developer Frogware announced that Sinking City was delisted. Oculus and Respawn showed off a first look at Medal of Honor VR. Call of Duty dropped their first gameplay trailer for Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. And Fall Guys developer Media Tonic showed off season two of in-game content, which includes new maps, new skins, and much more. But despite all of that, for this week's episode, I wanted to talk to you about the next generation of consoles. We are now closer than we have ever been to the inevitable release of the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X. And it's really weird because we are eight weeks away from November when both consoles are expected to launch. However, both PlayStation and Xbox have yet to even announce an official release date or even a cost. But that hasn't stopped outlets from speculating when we might get our next-gen consoles. In fact, Video Game Chronicles posted an article this week in which they used retail sources who claimed Sony has purchased significant marketing spend for the seven days commencing on Friday, November 13th, leading them to speculate that the PlayStation 5 must be launching the week of Friday, November 13th. And as far as the Xbox Series X launch goes, Video Game Chronicles speculates that the console will release the week before. But again, none of this has been confirmed by either PlayStation or Xbox. So without a launch window or a cost, we are kind of left in this weird limbo. And I've been thinking a lot about this, you know, where do I land on these two consoles? Because for me, the reality is, I, I can't buy both. And the choice of, do I buy the Xbox Series X or do I buy the PlayStation 5 is a very real question that many gamers are going through right now. So I thought for this week's episode, let's break down the two consoles into three categories. Hardware, content, and the platform's track record in hopes that maybe it will help us in making that decision. So first up, let's talk about hardware. The Xbox Series X is definitely the more powerful of the two consoles, with the console featuring an 8-core custom Zen 2 processor and a GPU that is capable of processing 12 teraflops of data. Which, let's just pause right there, because the word teraflop is a buzzword that gets thrown around a lot, so let's clarify exactly what it is. One teraflop represents roughly one trillion calculations being performed in one second. So the Xbox Series X having 12 teraflops would allow for up to 12 trillion calculations being calculated in one second, which is insane. But now back to the specs. The Xbox Series X also features 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 RAM, a one terabyte custom solid state drive, and the console will allow for 4K resolution at 60 frames per second with the capability of supporting 8K resolution at 120 frames per second. And another technical note here, 120 frames per second is definitely a buzzword that sounds really awesome when said. But the reality is, the human eye is only capable of seeing 60 frames per second. So even if a game ran at 120 frames per second, it would be extremely difficult to tell the difference. Now the PlayStation, in comparison, will feature an AMD Zen 2 processor, a GPU that is capable of processing 10.3 teraflops of data, 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 RAM, a custom 825 gigabyte solid state drive, along with offering 4K resolution at 60 frames per second, along with supporting 8K resolution at 120 frames per second. Now, while Sony definitely isn't as beefy in these specs as the Xbox Series X is, it does have its own set of unique features. For example, its custom solid state drive is capable of processing 5.5 gigabytes in raw data and up to 9 gigabytes of compressed data per second, which is nearly double the speed of the Xbox Series X's SSD. And the PlayStation 5 also features a brand new wireless DualSense controller, which includes things like haptic feedback and adaptive triggers, which can change the tension of the trigger spring to simulate different scenarios. In Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, the triggers will have different feelings for each gun that you use. In Deathloop, when your gun jams, the triggers will lock, preventing you from shooting until you fix your gun. And with Horizon 2, your triggers will be able to simulate the tension of pulling an arrow back on the strings of a bow. 
and for me, while Xbox definitely has the more powerful console, the innovation of the DualSense controller really has me leaning towards PlayStation this generation. But of course, that is only one of the categories. Next up, let's talk about content. Because let's face it, content is king. Both PlayStation and Xbox have been pretty vague when it comes to announcing console launch lineups as this brave new world with COVID-19 has created studios delaying video games literally left and right. So for this part, instead of discussing, you know, launch lineups, I figured, you know, let's talk about what has been announced. Right now, we know the games like Watch Dogs Legion, Warframe, Rainbow Six Siege, NBA 2K21, Cyberpunk 2077, Madden 21, Marvel Avengers, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, and Assassin's Creed Valhalla will all run on the next generation consoles. In fact, both PlayStation and Xbox have ensured that the consoles will feature backwards compatibility, where the Xbox Series X will be able to run almost every Xbox game ever made, and the PlayStation 5 will be able to run all PlayStation 4 games. But when the conversation comes to the topic of exclusives, well, the upper hand definitely starts to lean towards PlayStation. The PlayStation 5 will be home to games like Bug Snacks, Deathloop, Demon's Souls, Ghostwire Tokyo, Godfall, Gran Turismo 7, Horizon Forbidden West, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, Returnal, Sackboy, A Big Adventure, Spider-Man Miles Morales, and Stray. Whereas Xbox has announced State of Decay 3, Forza Motorsports, Fable, Halo Infinite, Avowed, Everwild, Stalker 2, Warframe 40,000 Darktide, Martha is Dead, and The Medium. And really, this part of content comes down to personal preference. You know, what games do you want to play? However, it does go hand in hand with our next category, track record. Going into this next generation with the massive void in information, platform track records can be a really helpful way to get an idea of what life would be like with that console. For example, on the topic of exclusive video games, the PlayStation 4 was home to over 74 exclusive games, whereas the Xbox One was home to 11 exclusive titles this generation. And when you compare that list of exclusives, it becomes pretty telling. The PlayStation 4 had games like Infamous Second Son, Horizon Zero Dawn, Uncharted 4, Ghost of Tsushima, Last of Us 2, Final Fantasy VII Remake, God of War, and Spider-Man, where the Xbox One had Rare Replay, Dance Central Spotlight, Fighter Within, Forza Motorsport 5, and Halo 5 Guardians. Now, to be fair, Xbox did have other first-party games, but they were also available on PC, so they weren't technically a console exclusive. But in Xbox's defense, they are home to one of the best services in gaming with Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, where for $15 a month, a gamer can have access to over 200 games and have the ability to stream them to smartphones or tablets with Project X Cloud. And PlayStation does have PlayStation Now, which is similar, but when compared to Xbox Game Pass, it does feel a little dated. And the final thing I kept coming back to with track record is my personal experience. You know, I still have my PlayStation 4 that I bought on day one. However, with Xbox, my Xbox One was quickly proven unnecessary with the introduction of the Xbox One X and Xbox One S. Because I never upgraded, and while playing games with friends who used the X or the S, there was a noticeable difference in gameplay experience that, in my opinion, caused unfair advantages. Things loaded or rendered faster on the X, and games became optimized for better consoles, and when they launched on my OG Xbox, they still had a ton of issues. And I get it, the argument against that is just upgrade your hardware. But the reality is, I didn't have to with my PlayStation. While playing with my friends who have a PlayStation 4 Pro, there isn't an unfair advantage. Games work on the PS4 despite where you choose to play them. And for me, that is the driving force going into this next generation. Which platform will I feel safe investing my money into and not be expected to shell out $500 two years later just to play video games and eventually replace it? And for that reason, along with a massive library of new and existing games, 
huge steps forward with new hardware and controllers, I am choosing PlayStation. Hey, thanks again for checking out our channel. Are you like the thousands of people in the comment section down below wondering why does this channel have so little subscribers? Well, you can fix that today by subscribing to the channel, liking the video, commenting, and sharing it with your friends, which I know sounds like a lot, but I feel like our channel is worth it.